call the meeting to order. Um, we've got a few people here who've come for specific issues. Um, one of them involves a staff person who's here to talk to us in executive session. It'll take five or ten minutes and then they can go home instead of waiting forever. Um, and then we have some residents here to speak to us again about the sidewalk on Fifth Avenue. We could do that next. And then finally, uh, Karen Boquillen is here to talk to us about another matter. So I'd like to take those one, two, three, and then the meeting can just take its normal course. So unfortunately, after you've all come in here and settled down so nicely, I'd like to ask you again to leave. Uh, discuss land acquisition. And is there a, a way to know what, which land acquisition you're speaking of? Not yet. Okay. So um, we are prepared to talk about Fifth Avenue. This is a convenient time for you. Yes, it is. We're just here to find out what kind of progress you've made on um, making our streets safe for the winter. We have, um, we're the same three people that were here before because it's in front of our, our residences, so we're you know, concerned about people being hurt in front of our houses. And we also have our senior resident here with us who'd like to speak to you right. um, because the way he gets around is strictly by walking. He can't do that so well in the winter time. Jack, do you want to talk to them? Uh, what's your name, sir? What is your name, sir? Jack Fagan. Hello? Hi, Jack. Hi. Hi. Jim. What are you doing? Hiding down here, yeah. Jim? <laughs> God. At least one old timer around here, right? Oh! <laughs> Jeez. The rest of these young people here, I don't know. Kids. So did but you have save me! I want to be around a while and you, you cut out that ice skating rink that I have to go to cross. It's important because that's my beer run down through the <laughs> thing, and I want it, you know, be safe. I don't want to drop anything on the way back. So I'll improve that that spot. Right, thank you. So Ned, do you have uh, any? Uh... It's on the list of things to do. Um, as I explained, we had a conversation the other day. It's on the long list of things to do, and and then we're hoping to be um, Thank you. Um, at a minimum, that we hope to at least get the bank scraped back for the winter and see if that alleviates some of the icing damming problems that are out there. Because uh, if you recall right, the last time we discussed this, the the uh, between the sidewalk and the street, there's additional material that's accumulated over the years and. It's kind of created a dam structure there that's right. holding it in place also. But then during the winter, the snow banks build up there as well? Well, I mean, there's nothing we can do about the snow banks, right? I mean, if we get snow, we end up with snow banks. But what we saw last winter was that um, there's snow banks all up and down the street. Um, but just in this particular area, there's no way for like when it, it there's a thaw, or if we use thawing agents, there's no way for the water to escape, so it just keeps building up and refreezing until it's so thick that even if we try to do something to it, it's mm. ineffective. We can't we can't get rid of it, so it stays, um, you know, pretty thick ice. You know, once it starts, it's almost like an ice dam building up. We can't, you know, we right. can't get rid of it. And I know there was a concern about, um, you know, tree roots. Um, but those tree roots that, that um, have caused it to be raised up, they are from a dead tree. They are not from that tree, Ned, that you saw that's a little bit further down the street. Mm -hmm. There actually was a tree right almost on the edge of our driveway that the DPW took down maybe three, four years ago because um, it was nearly dead. And that's what those bunched up tree roots are from, or from the, the no longer existing tree. Right. So it's been ground down. You don't even see it. You don't see the stump. But you still see the tree roots, they're up higher. And um, one thing that Ned and I talked about, and this is just so preliminary, it's for most of the people at the table, it's news to them too. Um, I was wondering if we might be able to at least give some guidance to people who are willing to pay for the improvement in front of their house. 
I just don't think there's any way that the city can put much money into the problem. It's, it's just on a long list of things that we can barely afford to get to. So uh, the DPW can't take that, it can't take the tree belt in that area where it's bumped up, can't take a small bucket loader and just grade it so it... it th that's it's, the thought, is to give that a shot, and it's on a list. And basically what happens is the highway superintendent is looking at the jobs and trying to triage the ones that need to happen immediately and working his way down the list of the smaller items, which unfortunately something like this would fall into that category. So this this item could be completed money-wise, but perhaps not time-wise? I mean, I'm a little confused. Fair to say? Well, a full sidewalk reconstruction might work more difficult monetarily-wise versus cutting back some of the existing buildup on the green belt and so on and, and moving some material around would be an easier fix right now. And that's kind of what we looked at programming in for this fall to see if that alleviates the problem first. I mean, so this is, this is the only street. happened before ice season. Well, that's what we're planning on. Okay. Um, but the, the issue also is the fact that uh, we haven't even started center line painting yet. We're still doing pothole repair that typically were done in May or June at the latest. And it's a matter of we don't have the resources to take care of our infrastructure that's falling apart. Right. And sidewalks is part of our infrastructure. Every year we lay off one, two people. We have for years as the budget contracts or doesn't expand while well, our expenses do expand for insurance and everything else that we pay for. Um, I don't think there's any way that the sidewalk, sidewalk is going to get reconstructed we weren't Anytime asking soon. for that. I understand. We, we were asking for it to be graded. And we actually, before we came here, at, at, at least at number five and seven, we've had several landscapers come and look at the situation to see what we could do. Now, we can't touch the tree belt, okay, because it doesn't belong to us. And so we were look, you know, we said, you know, is there something we should be doing with our driveway? And what we had them say to us, anything you do to your driveway, it won't matter because you have that at the a, end. Because there's a dip in the sidewalk. Because there's a dip. And whatever comes down there, and there's a gradual grade, whatever comes down is going to end up at the bottom of that because the, the tree roots and there's a piece of, we have one small section of um, curbing on the street. And that curbing, is, it makes it higher than everywhere else, and you can see it. I, I've made a DVD for anybody <laughs> who <laughs> wants to see it and can't get it on their computer. I can. You can watch it on your TV at home, and you can see that the rest of the street, because she snow blows the whole sidewalk on the street right down to Jack's house, and so it gets the same treatment all mm -hmm. winter. And you can look right down the street and go, oh, it's all dry pavement there, and it's a skating skating rink right here. All right, so all we can say for today is it's on the list. It sounds like they're making an effort to me to have it taken care of before ice season. Uh, doesn't appear that we can give you at this point a, a week or a day when it's going to happen. Um, Is there a way that we that you, you could let us know when it's going to happen? Like you could send us an email saying, well, I, I have okay, we're on it. I have one person's email address that sent me a link to a video. That would That's be yours, it. okay. That would be so I have that one that I can send an email to once I talk to Richie to see where it's at on the list. I just don't know where it is. Okay. It's on our long list of things to do. So I think that's all we can offer you this okay. evening. But it sounds, it sounds like there's a good chance this will get taken care of in time for uh, winter beer runs. <laughs> Groceries, uh, too. Groceries, I mean, groceries. <laughs> okay. I, didn't, I didn't hear that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. I think Thank you. Get down the stop and shop. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, and then the last oh, thing. Oh, the hell are you? Number one under old business. That's the reduction for handicapped records. Yes. Is there a second? Second. Doing that? Right. Karen is going to report to us on the uh, ad hoc committee's meetings. Mm -hmm.
So we did meet on uh, September 20th for the Committee on Disabilities. So Mary Ann um, and Ruth and Patty were there, plus 12 other people. And we talked about it for about an hour. Um, it, it turns out that even though I was trying to explain that what the board wanted was a financial needs approach to either a permit discount or a trash discount, whatever, um, it, it became apparent that they are quite fixed. I say they, those three people, um, Diane Lake was not in attendance, are quite fixed on the um, handicap placard or plate qualifying s someone for a discount and that the, uh, the senior age would be reduced to 60 years old. And when I suggested that in terms of a financial need approach, one, one place we could start would be to um, just qualify all the ones that are getting the exemption under 41C because that's already a system that the city is using. And the response was no. That would be that approach would be vetoed. You know they would not advise that. It's apparent to me that they're looking. They're not looking at financial need. They are looking at the handicap um, standard and also uh, the 60-year-old standard. Patty Shaughnessy is actually willing um, to go beyond and look at what what else might uh, qualify people for a discount. Um, and we won't be meeting again as a committee um, until Marianne returns from some traveling October 26th. But in the meantime, I have made some contacts with Community Action, Survival Center, Safe Passage, some other organizations that are working with the target population and seeing, you know, there's all kinds of um, programs where people qualify for various types of assistance. So. And we're all just, of these organizations probably have some criteria. Yes. So we're looking at a way where they could basically send them pre-qualified to us so that we don't have to do the vetting. And something that's practical. And also, I find that, that people are maybe in financial need for a period of time and then come out of it. So I think it would probably... Um, probably wouldn't be for... Like, we might issue the discounted permit, but if there were trash permits or trash discounts, that that might need to be um, done on a quor quarterly basis or something like that. So in the meantime, while the committee can't meet again, um, I'll be doing some homework. And I did mention that because they had um, apparently decided this was the recommendation they would make about the handicapped 60 um, years old that they could come to the board with that recommendation anytime and said you might not be receptive to that. And Mary Ann said that she would just take it to the city council and get it done that way. So okay. um, and I also went if, are there any questions about that? So I'll be coming back probably the end of um, the end well, the end of October, beginning of November with some recommendations. Okay. Um, Do we just have a, a sense of how many households or how many people that are impacted by this decision? Well, the uh, 41C exemptions are really just property owners, and we're talking about hundreds, like 400 people. Um, and, and what we grant, uh, if we use this criteria, is we're granting the transfer or the uh, landfill, per the permit to use the transfer station from $25 to $5. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about a $20 a year discount here. Yes. Well, that's that's kind of the concept that we're starting with. Obviously, the uh, $5 discount may, tr may be changing um, in the future when the landfill closes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That hasn't been determined. So the fees stand under law. Yeah. Scale the scope of the number of people yeah. So that, when I say there's so many different um, ways that people qualify for assistance, there are all different bars and thresholds. Mm -hmm. So we have to look at what would be practical. It's a good point too, depending on the number. You may, you may need to look at the, 
the, the fees that are charged for other folks to make sure that the <coughs> revenue, the revenue balance is there. Mm -hmm. You can't give out hundreds of discounts for accounting for them in some manner. Right. But I, I guess I'm also thinking about the number of the staff <coughs> time and energy that's being put into research this, and it, it's a big impact. You know, okay, it makes mm -hmm. sense, but we're talking about a relatively small impact. Yeah. Well, so community action, they they actually do deal with most of the people who who need some kind of assistance and they were they were talking about hundreds of people, not thousands. Yeah. Oh, my original statement stands. Uh, just because you have a handicap sticker doesn't mean you need a discount. I mean, some people with a handicap sticker make 50000 60000 70000 a year. And why would they need a handicap, why would they need a discount on trash? So it's, it doesn't make sense. That approach doesn't make sense. The only approach that makes any sense is a financial one. And I am all for giving a financial one. But I a carte blank for a handy because you have a handicap sticker? No. No, I don't qualify. I have a handicap sticker and I don't qualify for a discount. Uh, Ambro? Well, I support Jim's statement and I also support the fact that after the solid waste uh, uh, committee supported by the mail, we move forward on a means-based discount, and I would like to see us continue in that direction. It may be part of the problem that there's a vacuum, because we haven't done that. That was one of my questions for tonight, is uh, where are we in terms of moving forward on the other recommendations? Yeah. If, can I? Yes. <laughs> um, I, I, was, I was thinking about it, and I, I agree with Jim and Roe, there's not a logical connection between the handicap and low income. Um, but part of resolving this is to make sure that the handicap sticker does qualify you for uh, special parking, perhaps extra assistance, the concierge level um, option for another vehicle or a, a neighbor or a friend using their sticker. Actually, we do have the handicapped and disabled permit that's through the Council on Aging that allows caregivers and caretakers and people from out of town to assist. But there are some restrictions, yeah. aren't they? Don't they have to yes. be a relative? No, no, but they can be a care. Out of town. Yes, because so assuming that if you're in town and you're bringing your trash to the transfer station, you can afford to buy a permit, a regular permit, even if you're taking your mother-in-law's stuff with you if, okay. if you're right. resident. So, so part of resolving this would be getting our policies in order. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other thing my wife suggested is sometimes um, her career was in special ed. Sometimes she thinks there should be a category called special circumstances mm -hmm. where people just don't drop neatly into a it's just a thought. Yes. But there could be a catch-all called special circumstances, which would be totally decided on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. That's all I have for. Okay. Could that be decided on by a committee? <coughs> could be a committee, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. But there would be a lot of people wondering if they'd fall into that. Well, it's just a, it's just a thought. It's a spitball here. Right? <laughs> um, does anyone else have a question or a comment for Karen? I have a very quick update on the bag program, if you want that. Um, just where we are. And I've got some little pictures I hope you can see. Um, I want to just review the permit sales, the bag sales, the trash and recycling tonnage, and, the, and a few other things. So um, this, this little chart is for four years. It's 2008 to 2011 for a three-month period, which is June to now which is our permit sales. Um, right now we're at 89% of what we were last year at this time, but last year we started June 1st selling the vehicle permits. This year we started July 1 because of the transition with the bags. <coughs> so basically you can see the seniors are, you know, we're at 100% of seniors already, and we're selling a lot of residential 
permits. So we're not losing a lot of um, customers to other options at this point. Um, and with the, the bag sales, and it says bag stickers, but it's converted. This scale doesn't really help, but right now we're at, we're at about 96% of where we were last year. And Bags per stickers. Yes, and it's about $20,000 per month, which is where we have been. We will not have clean data for a couple of months because of the, you know, we, we're still switching out stickers for bags, and that revenue had already been collected, you know, in the past, and, you know, we're just giving out bags. So I'll, I'll keep updating the data as, as much as I can. But basically, we're kind of on track with, with bag sales. Um, the Locust Street trash, the trend has been down, so this we're at 91% of what we were last year at this time for August. And, you know, it's just the trash is going down. That's the way it has. And was that true last year compared to the previous yeah, year? Yeah, because this is 2008 to 2011. And then uh, MRF recycling, this mirrors the regional trends and, and economic impacts. Um, it's interesting. The containers are kind of straight, but the paper is going down. You know, newspapers have been light weighted, and you know, there's a lot of changes and reasons why paper recycling is going down. Um, the composting program is is going great. It's um, that's increasing. Um, the proportion of bags that we're selling, or, or it's, I'll say in percentages between small, medium, large, 10% small, 60% medium, and 30% large. And that's completely on its head from other communities where they figure 70% large and 30% uh, medium for a normal community. Yeah, so we're backwards on that. So um, the total number of bags that have been shipped through retailers is about 60,000. We've had to reorder bags already, but that inventory actually, you know, we've got another two months before kind of all this goes through. So the acceptance is very good now. Um, compliance is excellent. People are beginning to tell us how much they like the program. <laughs> and that it's, you know, not as bad as... They thought it was. <laughs> yeah, and the, we still have a few issues with the bag quality, which we've been dealing with. You know, the drawstrings failing, the seams, drawstrings, seams failing. So, you know, that's, that's a manufacturing issue that we're making a lot of noise about. Jim has a question. Uh, when you uh, showed us the financial, we're right on right on the mon money with uh, the amount of financial that we've taken in so far this year as to last year. Well, it's, should it's, we it's not be, math. <laughs> should we not be increased? Yes, but by quite a bit because the bags went up a buck. Yeah. Well, the bags were two dollars last year, and I was comparing it to last year, 2010. So you were comparing apples to apples. Yes. Then. Um, but we won't see if, um, if we're getting in increased revenue for a couple of months. And it's, you know, as I said, we're still switching out the stickers for bags. Um, you know, people buy a certain inventory of bags and then have to, you know, we have to get into a regular cycle. It's going to take a little while. I drive around the city quite a bit, and I see a lot of uh, canisters on the side of the road now being picked up. I think quite an increase as compared to what we had the people going to private contractors. Well, I think that that is shown by the um, the decrease in residential um, the permit sales. So the seniors are staying with the transfer stations. We are, you know, gradually Loser. losing some residents yeah. who, you know, would rather have the convenience of curbside 
and the cost isn't as much of a factor. Or they could be using Valley Recycling. Or they could be using Valley Recycling. But I go by there a lot, and they um, they are not busy. Um, they've actually gained a lot of customers from Southampton because they have a $75 permit. Um, East Hampton is, is their primary business. We've, we've gained from Southampton? No, no, no Valley right Recycling. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly we have lost some. To Valley Recycling, or or some people go there occasionally, even if they have a um, have one of our vehicle permits. Uh, have any other questions? <coughs> Karen, thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, next for your approval, the minutes of the August seventeenth uh, BPW meeting. Hold on, hold on. Second. Comments or corrections? All in favor of accepting those meetings? Aye. 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 Minutes? Uh, and then minutes of the September 14th meeting. Second. Uh, that's a correction. Second. 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 Sure. On the top of page three. There's an incomplete sentence that starts with my name. What? <gasps> Maybe that was intentional. Maybe it was a, maybe it was a direct quote. Go this asked if a group of residents wanted to. Oh, okay. So I can take such a bourbon. Thank you. I'm, I'm sure I'll yep. pick a bourbon. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. Okay. So, all set. All in favor of approving those methods? Aye. Aye. All right, next we're going to have a, uh, a presentation the uh, the new building, the new DPW building in the back. The architects are here. Uh, George Andrakides is here, and they're going to dazzle us with opportunities and options. Okay, where's the peanuts and soda? That's right. Popcorn. This is about the only time you see it work out. Yes. Yeah, this is it. I've been waiting for three years. I can't believe that. I do know that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So the movement of the vehicles on the site is very similar to what we have now where they'll be entering off of Locust Street. Um, the recycling center, which is up front, will remain as is, um, hopefully with more of the concentration of the, the works of the facility in the, in the uh, northern portion of the site, there will be less um, overlap in those two spaces, but I think will be good. Um, and the fuel island, which is right here, will be uh, shifting a little bit uh, further onto the site because the, um, the fuel tanks are, are relatively young, but the superstructure is old. So we'll be shifting that superstructure away from it so when the tanks do have to be replaced in, in some given time, you will not have to remove the superstructure along the way. Um, and, and then the, these two gray structures back here are your salt and sand sheds, which will not move as well. So that, those are all sort of the fixed pieces that will remain on, um, on the site. And everything else will change. I mean, it will, you know, the, the movement of the vehicles, where the parking is, and all that. And I'll just kind of drive you, and if you're in a vehicle, you have multiple ways to go. You can come and fuel and um, circulate you know, out of the site, whichever way, even turn right around and go out. If you're a city vehicle, if you're coming to um, collect salt and sand in the wintertime, um, the, the, the process of moving the salt or sand out of the buildings and onto the bed of the trucks is a a process and that could happen two ways, either that direction or that direction depending on which movement you want. Um, this yellow structure here is a gantry a, a, a structure, the sander bodies for the vehicles will be in that structure, will be, um, they're very heavy, they have to be loaded onto the beds of the truck and there will be a structure to lift those and get those on and they'll stay protected um, during the year. So those will be there. And then a normal truck, um, if it's coming into the day and it's going into maintenance, will travel this path and into maintenance here. Or if it's going to park, it will um, go into this yellow block here, which is the vehicle storage building, and will circulate it around and out again. Um, all of the parking for employees will be in the uh, southern portion of the site. Um, and right now they park, you know, there's a lot of parking back here, so that will be all buildings. Yes? The rear? Exit. That remains, but we're not we're not touching that. That's uh, that's not part <coughs> of the process. I think that if you want to speak to that a little bit. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. It was put in. I, I don't know when it was put in, but I know the neighbors don't particularly care for it. Uh, so yeah, what right. we look at doing is using it as as is only, which is employees and DPW traffic. Yeah. Not not making it a main entrance into the facility for our use. Um, so that's the site. Um, we'll be building, uh, we'll have store more management, of course, on the site. Um, we have to deal with that. We have to follow the rules and regulations. We have to follow the setback, the zoning requirements um, of the city. All of that is represented on this plan. Um, they are still in concept. What, we're in the, what the process we're in right now is getting a cost estimate done. So our engineers have to own a lot of scope right now. Not a lot of detail, but enough scope that the, uh, the estimator can price this out and tell us where we stand before we go any further because we don't want to go down some paths that we can't recover from quickly. So um, you know, you'll, you'll see some things like this right now and that's, you know, we have to manage the water on the site. There's a lot of water on the site and, you know, one of that's one of the options that we're doing, you know, you know under consideration are underground structures which are more costly. Um, there's a lot of things we can do possibly using this site as well to deal with some of that water. So that's a process that's ongoing right now. Um, and um, you know, we'll know more about that in the next few weeks as we begin to see the costs and everything. This is the, the new public works facility in the back. Um, it's represented in the flat five major blocks of space. Um, the yellow block, which is a vehicle storage, is about almost 22,000 square feet of space. That is this large block right here. You'll drive around the site, enter park, back up, and exit around. That's a vehicle storage, a prep area, but they'll be doing a storage of vehicles, storing plows, doing their safety checks in there, but it's a pretty unoccupied space. Um, there's a lot going on in it. It may be unoccupied on a daily basis, but there's a tremendous amount of work going on in the space, a tremendous amount of storage. It'll be captured in mezzanine spaces um, for this building. Um, there's a lot of equipment and, and supplies and whatever that goes along with one of these buildings, and you have to store them someplace, and that'll be in that part, portion of the building. The, uh, the next part is maintenance, which is all this green right here. 
And those are um, actual maintenance bays with, you know, just like in any garage, they have lifts, they have fluid distribution systems, they um, take, tear our engines apart, they do whatever they have to do. There's, a, there's um, different kinds of lifts to, depending on the vehicles. And then they have, there's a bunch of support spaces for um, this. Um, they, they keep parts for all their trucks, or the majority of their trucks on site, or at least some of them. They have a fluid room, they have a lot of fluids in vehicles, so they have to contain that fluid. Um, there are office, some office administrative spaces. They do have to do research on parts. Um, they have a, sort of a library of, of catalog and stuff like that. Um, they have their tools. Um, there's a, a tool bin here because these um, employees have you know, very expensive <coughs> tools that need to be stored and, and things like that. And then there will be some mezzanine space above these spaces as well for tire storage, extra parts, um, whatever is needed. And there's a lot that goes along with BPW. The one bay that's sitting on the side here is the welding bay. Right now, um, when you go over the welding, they've got jury rigged, all kind of inefficient um, <laughs> systems set up. But it, it serves a purpose right now, but this will be a, a you know, sort of separated and a, and a good space to do that. And there will be a small paint booth for small objects um, contained, a paint booth right there. The um, shops area is about 7,000 square feet, and that's this uh, grouping in here. And the, um, the different divisions that are in there, highway or water or central service, they all have a small individual space that's de defined by just essentially uh, a gated system, like a chain link fence system that will separate the different divisions because they all have different needs and they don't have tools to cross and you want to keep them separate. Um, the water department stores copper and, and expensive items. You don't want those sitting out. You want those secure. So they'll all have it. That's a, you know a wide open space that's subdivided, and they'll be able to ultimately within their space rearrange their things as they need or as it needs change. But they'll have shelving in there, uh, bins, uh, pegboards, whatever they need. And we program individually with each of these departments to size it. There's a, a, a shared shop area right here where they each have a little bin, so they can keep <coughs> specialized tools. But they'll share all the workspaces, and um, the common spaces. So that's a, a big savings, you know, no duplication of spaces for them. They also have direct access off the vehicle storage. So, for instance, if they're bringing in a piece of equipment that needs to be on the truck or brought in, they'll bring, be able to bring it in and bring it to that overhead door right <coughs> into that space. So it's pretty efficient. It's a matter of rearranging the cars for that day or the trucks for that day. Um, and then there's some support spaces, mechanical spaces that we need in the building. We're also right in here, we're having the city electrician and the city plumber. Um, they'll be located there as well. So each division has um, is sharing the space, but they also have dedicated storage, which is important. Um, they work, you know, they have different rules, different responsibilities, and different equipment. Um, this kind of the color here, this kind of brown color is administration, which includes office, some office space, conference space, a lunchroom and a training room, and then all of these are toilets and lockers. Um, all the showers. Kind of showers, showers, toilets, lockers, sinks. Um, all the things that are support that provide support to to the staff. I mean, they have some pretty dirty jobs that they go out to do, and it's really good that they have a place to clean up and put their personal belongings in a safe environment. Um, so there's really only two offices that are occupied: the water department and the highway department at this point. Um, and some administration space. Hopefully, in the future, when the McNulty comes, that'll change that mix. But we had to accommodate. At least those two people right now, they, need, um, they do office work and they need uh, an appropriate space for that. The last piece is the wash bay, which is this blue uh, piece on this side right here. That is going to be an add alternate to the project. It is currently not in the budget, but we are planning for it. So we're doing a space planning. We're going to put it and hopefully bid it and see what it comes in at. And miraculously, the bids, depending on where the economy is on that day, um, you know, it's a possibility that that, that wash bay will, a contained wash bay will be in the project. So that's that space. So the total without the wash bay is 49,323, and with the wash bay is 52,300 square feet of space. Um, it's, it's a very efficient plan. There's not a lot of corridors, um, and we're trying to tighten up as much as possible. Question. Yeah, I, I do. Um, I had written that down. The automatic uh, truck, truck wash right. um, uh, is uh, quite a concern to the Department of Public Works, uh, especially with their sanders. Mm -hmm. They go out in the middle of winter. Uh, they come in these things if they're not right. completely washed under, right. in, out, everything. 
uh, you don't have a truck next That's year. That's right, you don't. So, uh, this is, is that going to be an automatic? Uh, well, this is not designed as an automatic system at the time, although the, the, the layout is for an automatic system. So, you know, the rooms are set up, and that's what we're planning for. The equipment itself is a very costly item. We're talking a quarter of a million dollars of equipment alone for those systems. Uh, I don't, you don't have it in the budget right now. Well, Maybe a quarter of a million dollars, but one truck is a quarter of a million exactly. dollars. Exactly, and that's... You know, one of those big industrial items that we're looking at. Uh, there, there's an industrial engineer who's been working with the maintenance and everybody to lay out all the spaces to look at the uh, bridge cranes and the, you know, the vehicle lifts and all that. And that is part of it. Um, and I know that you know it's a preference, um, and whether it finds its way into the project or not will we'll really be dependent on where we see the estimates come in. Um, and um, we're certainly designing it so if the system comes in after the fact. Um, or after, you know, so say for instance, and you know, I haven't quite got my head around this one yet, but say the bids come in and you're, you're holding a contingency of 10% on a, a, on a $13 million project, and you don't, you don't meet your contingency, you may have money, and you'll know after a certain point where you're going to stand with your budget, you may choose to spend it. It won't be as an alternate, because an alternate in Massachusetts public law is you have to choose it. So if you put an alternate for the wash bay that's number one, you have to take it. If, and if they say that say that would cost hundred dollars. And you wanted to do something else that cost fifty, you couldn't take them out of order. You have to order them and take them in order. So it, it's better perhaps that we do the infrastructure and allow it to happen with the contingency later. Yes. Does this layout represent all of our space needs, or is there a second phase to there, any of these buildings? There is a second. There is no second phase in this project now. I think if you maybe remember back when I presented to the city council or earlier last year, there is a second phase of this project, which would extend this building okay. south okay. significantly. And when you can you go back to the site plan, if you look on the site plan, part of the configuration of this building is because we're we're dealing with the barns building. I, we did a, a, a period, a set of drawings that represent what would happen if, if the barn went away. Mm -hmm. What would you get? And, um, you know, there were op the options galore, but the reality is this barn's not going to go anywhere um, right now for a long, long time. And so we had to build around it, but we didn't want to um, make it so you couldn't add on. So you, we, we plan to add on in, in the future here. But you are getting, in this first phase, you're getting your maintenance and you're getting your administration and you're getting your shops. So the biggest thing you're missing right now is vehicle storage or outside cold storage, which would be raised beds of piping, uh, manhole covers, you know, things and, like that. And are we using the barns for that purpose? You're using the barns the, the whole in, time. Okay. It, right now, you're gonna, it's going to be as full as it is now. And, and it will rotate vehicles depending on the year, time of the year. And the goal is to use the existing barns for large vehicle storage, small vehicles during the first part of the uh, the yellow area, which is storage building, if the barns ever disappear in the future for whatever reasons, that is an expandable building. Uh, it doesn't be a prefab building right now, and so that could uh, expand to accommodate that need. We are we are structurally this is going to be pre-engineered and this is going to be conventional frame, um, but the exterior materials are going to be um, you know, very affordable materials we will be able to add on to. So we're doing two kinds of construction. This dimension right here is a, um, almost 100 feet clear span, and that's a, t a standard dimension for uh, vehicle storage and prep area. Jim? Yeah. Uh, Ned, uh, are we doing this the same way that they're doing the police station, where they actually have a guaranteed price and someone hired to see that they stay within the Within the, 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 the police station, you're the construction manager at risk. Yeah. We're, we are not. We're doing a conventional bidding with filed sub bids as we typically do our projects. Why can't we? We could do it that way. We discussed that internally with uh, Mayor Higgins and Joe Cook, the procurement officer. We decided that we would take this down the conventional bidding path rather than the construction manager at risk. The city's only done that for the police station, and the telltale signals aren't out there whether or not that was cost-effective or not successful. It's, yeah. a pre it's a pretty healthy environment right now for bidding. Mm -hmm. It looks, you know, pretty good. It, I'm, we're seeing prices even out of it a bit more, but it's still a healthy environment to do this traditional process. Um, we've done both, um, but, you know, right now we're doing the standard process. So. 
which will bid, we'll have, you know, up to 17 filed sub-bidders and the general bidders in the categories prescribed by Massachusetts general laws. So. This is the plan of the, a conceptual plan of the McNulty building. Um, this was part of the original design. I mean, we did the full bore scheme of the McNulty, the big building, and, and that was a, a big ticket item. But this is the McNulty building. We're sitting right now in that room right there, which is um, in the corner of the building, and the entry is right here right now. What we're doing for this is we're doing very, trying to minimize the reno renovation work in this building. We don't want to trigger too many code um, issues, so we're trying to just tie it as little as possible. And the only, um, other than putting a new vestibule, which is required with a lobby, required by energy codes and, and the built mass building, but we're taking the other side of the building. It's adjacent to um, the barns, if you imagine the roadway going back to the fuel island, and we're popping out that, that edge of the building just under the roof line. You know, it has those recesses, and we're popping out there to gain enough space to actually do this kind of a meeting space in a more um, comfortable environment um, where it will actually have, you know, good seating and, and whatnot. So that's that. But the, the concept is, is to um, bring people into the building and, and create a, a decent enough waiting space that people can be served, and this will be all administration. And they'll be kind of stopped and they'll have a window that serves them, might, much like they do now, but in a more controlled environment. And then everything else is relatively private to the, to the entire department. So you'll be brought back as needed or taken back to engineering if needed, but the majority of the public will be here. All the administration staff will be together to cross-serve everyone, so that's the, the concept. Um, and then and then you'll connect through, um, in the back here that engineering is now, there will be a series of, of spaces, toilet rooms, mechanical um, print rooms, and a, a small conference room for day-to-day -day working meetings. And then um, the back area here, this is engineering, and this is um, other pieces of administration here. So administration kind of moves around the building a little bit, but it's, it's not that choppy, it's not that big of a building, so it's not like you're getting lost in this long line. Um, a lot of what we're doing is driven by our restrictions on this side of the building, because we're adjacent to homeowners on that side, and not wanting to push out in that into the major pathways where the, um, the cars are moving. So, um, How far so, is, that, is that going to extend? Um, is, are there is the cherry trees back there, George? Uh, is that the there are there are three cherry trees right. on the other side of the parking lot. Unfortunately, those are going to be bad. But that's it. It's but you know it's sort of where the parking lot is and a little bit further back okay. right now. We did a lot, yeah. We did a lot of different plans. We rotated it, but you know, in in the end, this looks conceptually like the the best way to achieve the you know to meet the needs of the department. Again, this is conceptual. We are not taking this design any further than what you see here. The um, estimator will be doing a cost per square foot estimate, so you'll have an idea of what this will cost. Three or four years, you know, anything would uh, you know could happen. So. Um, but this will bring all of the engineering people that are down the water department, eventually down here, everybody under one roof, which would be ideal. Um, everyone would be here, and that would be the overall goal is to consolidate and um, you know, get those people all to be working together under one roof. Could you outline the footprint of the existing building as okay. opposed to? Uh, okay, so that's this. I see. And that, you know, those things are the dotted lines where the overhangs are. Okay. And imagine one running you know, north-south here. Okay. We just pop out to that wall. Yeah. The structure, interestingly, goes across uh, that window line, and so it continues, and then it's uh, posted down between the window where you would see some deeper framing, and they post it down there. So it's a pretty relatively simple construction to do. It's not like they ended the structure and they tacked on those edges. So, um, so the structural engineer is pretty comfortable with moving that. He just has to, by new code, he will have to assist her onto those, that framing and do a little upgrade because the building was built so long ago it doesn't be current. But as long as we don't do a certain threshold of repair, we can only do what we have to touch. So that was deemed the best way to do it. Um, and it keeps the, you know, it keeps, so when I'm, you know, have a meeting in here, you come in, you have a nice waiting room, you have access to the, the toilet rooms and you're right into the meeting space, which is what through a series of discussions, we have what was preferred here at the department. So, mm -hmm. so that's it, Malti. This is the elevation studies. Um, I might, we might want to turn the light off just for a second. Even that overhead light, you know, it's the upper one. Um, can you that? Just yeah, to, yeah, okay. just to, okay, just to see this a little better because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's in the colors. There's no colors represented here. It's just forms. This is the scale of the building we're seeing. 
Um, you can see, you know, little people popped in here. You can see the scale of the people and the vehicles compared to the building. These buildings are, um, you, know, you need some decent heights for these buildings, but they're as low as they can be um, to achieve it. Uh, the tallest building is the maintenance, uh, because obviously lifting these vehicles, um, they're big vehicles, they have tall pieces to them. So this is the building from above, and then Amy, there's a little video that we'll shoot that you can see and if it works. Um, you can see as if you're, you know, driving around the building or you're coming along the side to work around that way. Um, is the vehicle storage area heated? It is heated to 45 degrees. This is the uh, edge of maintenance. This is the wash bay piece, which is this. Coming around by the salt sheds now. These are all the maintenance doors along the back side. And coming into the edge of the vehicle storage building, which would be here. So we're going to use wooden shingles? <sighs> no. <laughs> so I can show you some of this. So, um, so you get a feel for the scale of the building, which is really important for people. So you never, we're not birds, we're not flying around the building, but you get, do get a sense of, of the scale of this building. It's not a small footprint um, at all, and, and relatively tall structures for a one-story building. Um, so. Heated vehicle storage, heated by what? Uh, Gas-fired radiant heating. It, um, it'll be suspended um, in the ceiling. So gas-fired, for those of you who know radiant heating, it heats objects, not air. So you've got masses of uh, steel and, and concrete in this building and uh, big trucks. So it will heat the objects and not the air. So it's a very efficient way, very good way of heating these buildings. and. Um, when there is a, a, a CO event, for instance, and all of these, all of the rooftops would open. These are skylights, by the way, but there'll be rooftop units up there to ventilate. There'll be, there's louvers on the sides. Um, when those doors open to, to do a CO event um, and the building goes cold quickly, when those doors go down and everything closes down, that will heat up relatively quickly because the heat will still be in the mass. Um, so that, that's what we've um, been doing for those. This will have, this part of the building will have um, a more conventional a rooftop unit with heat recovery and things like that. So this is 45 degrees, no air conditioning, no air conditioning. The only piece that will have air conditioning is this small section right here. Um, again, we got to turn this light up because you can't see a thing in this. Um, but you, these are little snapshots that you can see. And again, no color rendition. Uh, you know, it's just materials. And I have some materials that I'll show you um, of what you'll be seeing. Um, it's a, you know, we're, we're, we're building this building in it to, into a, essentially a utilitarian environment. It'll be durable surfaces. This will be about a four foot high wall of a concrete block. It'll also have concrete or, or, or block on the inside as well as push walls for the vehicles. Um, so you'll have uh, along the ground, you'll have this material. Then this is going to be metal um, and insulated panels. And this band right here is all clear story lighting. And that's a typical thing. And then we, you know, we will have some elements that will tie all these pieces together along. We'll have canopies over here to you know, give some um, uh, control over, you know, the worst of weather conditions of these. There'll be some banding that'll tie all these pieces together. We'll mark the entry so people know where to go um, through some materials. Same kind of metal materials. We'll just change out the materials. Um, and that here, this will be the administration building where there are people. We'll give them plenty of light so that um, they do not re you know, need day regular overhead lights for the most part of the day. They can rely on the windows um, or the skylights. Uh, clear story lighting. Okay. Well, just, what's a, yeah. what's yep. a CO event? A CO event is when all the vehicles, they, you know, turn on and they're all chugging away and they've got, you know, that's a few of it and it'll trigger, it'll trigger the louvers to open and the, the rooftops to open and it'll pull all that out. Um, there's a threshold. There's a threshold. So right now you have, you don't have that <laughs> and you should. I mean, you, these buildings would. Um, so these are all, you know, insulated doors with some vision lights in them. This is all clear story lighting all along the building, all these elements here. Um, entry. Um, so, <coughs> how about roofing? Roofing, roofing. Um, it's right now. Um, it's an EPBM so per talking to the city. A, a material selection. Um, I, you know, I gave a lot of options out there. EPBM, TPO, PVC, or bond bit, which 
you can't afford, but uh, you know, all the relatively, these are flat, this is a flat roof building essentially, it's not flat, no roof is dead flat, but um, there's a lot of options out there. And I heard back from the city at EPM, we have, we have some questions about that, whether it's actually the best material based on our discussion with roofers, but that's the direction we've gone from the city, um, direct from the city, so well, at why, EPM. Why are we going with flat roof? As opposed to a gable or something? Um, well, flat roof buildings are less costly <laughs> to build. Um, and um, these are very big buildings, so if you put um, a, a gable building on that 100-foot wide building, it, you know, even at a 5 and 12 pitch, would be, it, it, that would be going up more than 45 feet up into the air, um, which would exceed your building um, requirements, zoning requirements, number one, and number two would be a lot of, a lot of wasted space up there that you couldn't use. So um, in these large buildings um, with these very high spaces that is you know, a fairly efficient way of, of building them. Um, I, we got that question earlier today when we presented the building and you know, people were worried about buildings collapsing. Well, no, no, no buildings really collapse that are designed right and, and the building codes have been upgraded so much in the last 10 years that you know, there's relatively no chance of that happening. So I, you know, I can say that pretty comfortably. When, when you were talking about the options for the city for the roof, uh, were they talking about things like having solar panels on the roof? So that yeah, part of the building? Yeah, or? part of the building is being going to be structured to um, allow for a, a, a PV array, potentially. Um, whether, again, it's one of those things, whether it comes with this project or not, it'll be prepared, so they accept that. What are the pros and cons of having like the green roof? Like Smith College's science building has that? Um, um, we, you know, we've done green roofs. We just finished a green roof recently, and it's it. it they're not they're not that inexpensive to build. So there's a, a big first cost, and it really depends on stormwater management. How you do your stormwater management, if you need to pick up some of your stormwater management through the roof, but you, um, they are more expensive to build. Um, you do have to maintain them. You do have to mow them, um, sort of thing. So. We, you know, if I if I heard there, if we needed it, I would propose it, and we just done one, um, and and I wouldn't even propose if you know that you'd ever be able to see it. So if you see them or something, it wouldn't be any a beautiful one that you look down onto. That's really nice. It would be a real generic low rise seed. But uh, right Jenna, now we are, we are looking at water reuse off some off. Uh, Pardon me. We're looking at water reuse off the uh, off the roof. We have been talking about the one of the biggest challenges with that is actually having the physical space to do it, um, and where and how you would use it. We did a, a water collection system for a DPW that we did, where we had a large mezzanine, and um, we were able to put the, the tanks on those mezzanines, and, and then by natural drop, it dropped into their sweet, the street sweepers and things like that. It was a great system. You need the physical space to do that in, in, in well located. Or if you put it underground, then you have to buy the system to pump it back up. So it's still in play. Um, the, the, the location for our mezzanines isn't necessarily conducive to that because of the physical layout. Um, but you know, we're certainly open to that. We've done it before. It just takes up a lot of space. I mean, the town we did it for, they were so enthusiastic about it. But what they gave up in storage, it's not that they regret it because it's a great thing for them, but there is a serious trade-off in space. And because of your limited space right now, physical storage space, we trade that would be a big trade-off. We could do it underground. Again, um, building a, a structure underground at that scale and um, the energy use and the energy use to pump it back up, you know, would be a, a, a question. But I'd love to do it. I'd love to do it again. Personally, I wouldn't want to pump it. But. Yeah. If we could find a place, and if you go back to the plan, if we could find a place in one of the mezzanines, um, you know, to do it, see, you know, because here's our perimeter of our building. Well, here's our mezzanines, and here's our mezzanines are like choppy in here. And the, the plan that I was talking about, they had a mezzanine that ran like right here with on an outside wall, and they were able to take all that all those tanks and dump it right outside. And the other place to dump it is into the wash bay where we have no mezzanines close by, so we'd be piping it somewhere, which is a cost. Um, so, you know, there's lots of great ideas out there, and even that's one of the ones we've done, and it was a great thing. So, you know, maybe what we are doing right now, this may help us decide, Jen, is that um, 
we're looking, we're having our code expert look at the building and try to see if we can play, not play with, but look at the different ways of building the building and find a way to increase the amount of mezzanine that we're allowed by code. And normally, it can be only one third of the open area from which it's contained. So um, if we want to increase that, to provide something like that, then we have to move into a building, another building type, which may add cost. So it's, it's a trade-off. So. Um, uh, Janet, Janet, yeah. you may uh, sort of mention the cost of not only collecting the, the storm water, mm -hmm. but also treating it. Yeah, the water what comes off a roof is pretty clean, uh, amazingly. You really don't have to do a whole lot. What goes into the ground has to be treated a lot more. So the water, the water on the roof is relatively clean. You know, you put it into tanks with re relatively with relative ease. So that is actually the best place to take water off of this site and use it um, as opposed to anywhere else. But there is some cost, you know, there is some cleaning of it, but it's it's pretty minimal off the rooftop. So it's the tanks and it's more importantly the structure. You know, these this water is not light on any level. The structure is point three four pounds per gallon. Uh, yeah, it's <laughs> <laughs> so you put we I think we did um, um, 5,000 gallons of 10, really? 500 gallons really? in 10 <laughs> containers, and it took, it was the entire mezzanine of a building, so a significant um, space hog. Uh, we are looking at sustainability as an important feature. You, you have policy in town. This is not going to be a lead building, but we are certainly using a lead as, as, a, um, as a checklist and a way of looking at it. Our engineers and us are working with your energy consultants for the city to talk about systems. We've already had multiple conversations and they're having quite a long uh, conference call to talk about systems and reviewing them and discussing them and either you know, deciding they're appropriate or not, depending on what was offered. You know, there's a lot of things out there, but are, are they, do they make sense for this building? Um, not necessarily. So we've been looking at all of these kinds of technology, super insulation, low emitting materials, recycled products, which are pretty standard stuff. Heat recovery, radiant, different kinds of radiant, floor radiant versus ceiling, geothermal cogen, fuel cells, photocopic, on and on and on. There's a whole lot of things that we've been looking at and have conversations about what is practical, what is not. Um, two of the ones that I know people have been talking a lot, of, a, a lot about are geothermal and, and cogen. I'm not going to read these long paragraphs, but uh, JJ and JT are the, um, the mechanical engineers, and JJ is your, um, your energy consultant. And they both um, did some formal writing on why they think these systems, in both of these cases, are not the appropriate system for this building. Um, and um, I, you know, without going into it a lot, but the geothermal, there's huge capital cost involved, and, and where you really um, save the geothermal is if you have um, um, either high costs of fuel and heating or if you have a high air conditioning cost and, and things like that, neither of which you have in this building. And in, in our engineer's point of view, which is this one, because of the 45 degree minimal heating by way of the gas in three, you couldn't get a more, in his opinion, a more efficient system um, in this and, and because you still have to provide um, the purging. You know. So there's, there's a maintenance cost, there's a first cost which is quite high and, um, and a maintenance cost down the road. So um, they both agree, and that's the good news. It's not, they're not competing against each other. They both independently, it's been discussed, and independently wrote these, and they, they're very close on here. The code gen, the other system, um, needs a year-round heat um, sink for the, the, the waste heat. And the D, DPW is just really limited you know, summertime heating at all. Um, it, it needs to also, they function well when they operate 24-7. This building doesn't operate. It may operate 24/7 in an emergency, but not on a normal basis. So, you know, fully loaded conditions. That's from your energy consultant, and the uh, electrician um, people agree that you know, um, it, you just don't have what it takes to support the, the investment in a system like that, and um, it's just not economically sound. You don't have the around heating demand. Um, so. So we can, you know, we can get more information to you, but I think the, the best thing about this is they agree with each other that for your project this is not. We've done geothermal systems. We've not done a code gen on a DPW, but we have had some geothermal. Um, it was, we had, they had a bigger administration portion of the building, and, you know, it was sort of a demand, but it was a very expensive uh, payback period. 
but we are doing things like, you know, the site, um, you know, will you be doing analysis for economical site lighting, you know, that will meet light pollution limitations. And if you recall, LEED is, and that is not just about um, energy savings, it's also about building the building, lighting it, um, reflecting that light back up in the community, sound, and all those other kind of things. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the stormwater, um, we talked about bioretention cells to reduce the, the size of the, the basins, and um, we want to be careful how much land clearing we have to do to, to do it, but we still have to meet the code. There will, of course, be no irrigation on the site. Um, everything will be native plantings. We do have to do plantings, and they will be natives and, and hardy kind of stuff. We'll be looking at um, the, the, the materials that we select and how they are actually built, so we're going to make it so that the contractor is responsible for making sure that they have a waste management plan in place. Um, our products, we're going to try, we're going to pick as many recycled content products as possible. That'll include the concrete, which will have fly ash in it. Um, try to select products within 500 miles, although I did explain to someone that if we need a product and they don't make it in, in the general area, we can't go without the product. You know, it's just not going to enter into the discussion. Um, you know, there are certain things that need to be done. If there is any wood in the end, we'll make sure it's certified wood products. And the roof will have a high reflectance you know, to our property, so it'll be a white, essentially a white roof up there. Um, and we talked about the structure will be, have a plan for the future photovoltaic array. In the building, there's going to be low flow um, shower heads, uh, dual flush water closets, all that kind of stuff you see, low flush urinals, that's our um, self-powered self labs. Um, we're looking at some gray water and solar thermal, trying to determine in your community, in this building, whether those things will work the um, the, the, the first cost and the upkeep of, of some of those systems. Um, but we're going to be making sure that the indoor air quality is, is during construction is really good too, so that, that, that and when we started the building, it's a cleaner um, from your building. Low emitting materials. Um, uh, we're doing a lot of skylights and clear story windows to reduce dependency on artificial light, especially in the vehicle storage and prep areas, places like that where, you know, there's very little, you know, people action, but you need to see what, when you need to see, you need to see. But during the daytime, you know, people are coming and going and getting in and out of the trucks. We're going to have light where we need it and, and use the rest of the clear story in the, in the skylights to, to, to do the general lighting. Um, same in the administration building. Um, plenty of plentiful windows and um, some clear story lighting. Um, the building will meet this Massachusetts Stretch Energy Code, which is um, mandated here in Northampton. We are um, looking at a, a three-inch insulated panel, which has a 7.6 um, uh, uh, R value per inch. Uh, we'll be buying a three-inch product, which will put us up over 22 for the R value. But the Massachusetts Energy Code requires 16.6. So it's going to even exceed um, your Stretch Energy Code um, in Massachusetts. So it should be a a fairly um, very energy efficient building in just the materials themselves. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this for the mechanical systems, but you know we have code required elements to it, ventilation, um, things like that, and um, and and then we have the uh, and this is these all these um, different buildings were developed through discussion with your energy consultants and with the engineers. What makes the most sense? But anything they do will be. Selected will be energy efficient. We'll have it full economizers that will, you know, provide some uh, free cooling in the shoulder seasons. Anything that we can do to reduce the impact of the energy um, needs on the on the community. Um, uh, what else? Um, ventilation. Obviously, we have to ventilate these buildings. Um, these buildings have to be safe. The tailpipe exhaust. Yep. There'll be there'll, there'll be of course a um, a. Um, or a tailpipe exhaust system in the maintenance, which will also be very, very really good, you know, certainly for the workers uh, who, who work in these really tough environments. There are also, between each of these building components, are, are vestibules. So that'll keep the energy either in or out, <laughs> depending on where you are, and will keep the, the odors and the fumes that are in these buildings from uh, moving through into the spaces where people are actually living, which will ultimately lead to a healthier environment. Um, here's the schedule. Um, here's where we are. Um, we have a cost assessment. It's due at the end of next week. Um, we'll see where we are um, with the whole project. Um, 
the plan is to uh, you know, work on, we are in a state, we have finished design development. Um, we are going into the construction document phase, which are the documents that will go out to the bidders. Um, looking to 50% in November and, the, and then with a follow, following with a cost estimate and then the remainder of the drawings are done through January and with the updated cost estimate at the end of January. Um, putting the documents out to bid on March 1st. There's a, at least a minimum six-week process for bidding of the building. Um, so that will go for, on through April. And then um, we'll be negotiating the contract, hopefully within our budget with a selected bidder in, um, in for at least a month or so, depending on how, how the city operates. And we anticipate the construction starting in um, May of 2012 and completing in November of 2013 after about 18 months of construction. And that's that's tonight. So, um, okay. Oh, is that right? Great. So, George, do you want to add anything to that in terms <laughs> of um, the process coming up? I think that uh, Janet uh, covered it very, very well. I had a question, maybe George can, or George or Nick can address this. The, um, you know, the McNulty building, the layout's really great. And um, I've been showing it to, to folks on the engineering staff. And as Janet had mentioned, we've got people in this building and we've got professional staff in another building. And um, we're excited to get all the great people that we have together within work, one working space, which will make the work that we do more efficient and will you know, improve uh, um, you know, the staff uh, collaboration ability to work together. So um, I was just curious about um, the schedule for, that's really <coughs> sort of the second phase of the project, I guess. Um, could you do this at the second phase? And, um, let, me, just, let me have an answer. Uh, let me make a stab at it. Assuming that uh, we get the funding for the 16 and a half million, we are talking about finishing this particular project uh, by end of 2012. The second phase, if you all remember, of this project was the $26 million, which includes tearing down the barns and putting a $7 million uh, structure. Realistically, I don't think it's going to happen in my lifetime. I don't think it's going to happen in Jim's lifetime. Some of you are younger, so it may happen. I, mean, I don't know. <laughs> so I think that phase two really should oh, concentrate be on, well, <laughs> about that, on the McNulty <laughs> building, plus the things that we left out on phase one. They are critical, but we couldn't afford them. Maybe, namely, the open canopies because right now a number of vehicles and a lot of supplies that we have are still going to be left outside. Uh, the vehicle storage shed that we are proposing uh, is not going to uh, accept all the vehicles. So that is really phase two. If the capital improvements program of the city continues the way it is going, there is conceivable that uh, money could be appropriated 2013 at which time we can start finishing the design of this and then proceeding with uh, construction. So realistically, I personally do not see this building being completed at the earliest by, I would say, 2014, 2015, if we are lucky. Okay, so it's a, it's, it's a ways out. Assuming that all the pieces fall in place, And do you need, or were you hoping for anything from the board this evening? Personally, what I would like to do is get a feeling of the aesthetics. I mean, are we moving in the right direction? Uh, there's a lot of detail internally. If you, you, you need to spend some time looking at them before you can make some comments. You know, but generally, the building right now is it's taking a, a, a form in some shape. Are we going the right way? Uh, do you guys like to see towers or whatever? I mean, you know, it's, um, don't forget, you know, we are dealing with an industrial building. I am getting a bit excited to look at it. I think it looks 
pretty good. I know, it's silly. I'm liking those little wood things sticking out and the band. Oh, wood? <laughs> well, you know, they may, they may or may not be wood, but I'll tell you, I brought some stuff just to, oh, my goodness. We'll pick it up later. But I, I was thinking, Janet, that it might be not a bad idea if we had uh, the metal panels be midnight or sky blue, and, and she said she's going to quit. So. <laughs> <laughs> I just brought you, these are not colors for your project or whatever, but I did bring, just so you understood what the insulated panel looked like. Um, this is, these are the, these are the insulated panels we're looking at. Uh, multiple companies make it, you can see the insulation. Um, this is Kingscan. So you have a, a, a metal product on the outside that is painted, you know, you know, a selected color. And on the inside it's a finished product, so when the building goes up, it's finished on the inside already. What was the R value? This R value, I think, at three inches is 22.6. 22 and the stretch energy is 16.6. Two inches wouldn't do it, three inches will do it, so you would exceed it. And that's uh, con the, the continuous insulation. So that's the product that's, you know, close together. You know, you can see the, the two pieces. There are joints that fit it together. So that's that product. The, we're looking at bases, um, a masonry product. Um, this is the, one of our favorite block companies um, here. So you can see there's some really beautiful block out there that is portable to buy. They've just ramped up selections of materials so you can find some really lovely um, block. Now, before years ago, it was really pretty gray, hot gray, awful. Gray. Mm -hmm. Is that the outside? This is the outside yeah. finish. Oh, okay. Yeah, so they're, and, they're, and these come in lots of colors. And um, so whatever is selected eventually, and there's different finishes. So there's polished finishes, and there's honed finishes, and there's split face finishes. So there's, these are all the same color product. They're just all the different finishes bring out the aggregates differently. So we, you know, we as architects have spent a lot of time call, calling through the millions of materials out there and, and pushing people to make decent looking buildings um, with the, so we have good things. Um, this is an example of a, the clear story lighting product. This is a CPI day lighting product. It's an insulated panel. Um, it's a polycarbonate. It's a polycarbonate. And, um, and insulated, so you're, you're meeting our values. You're meeting our values. And that would get you light inside. And they come in two finishes, basically a clear and then a frosted look. So that would be all that clear story lighting. So it's a pretty simple system to put up. So yeah, that would be a Janet, given yeah. the uh, age of the barns next door, it, yeah. it's not, it wouldn't be shocking to hear this building was still in use 100 years from now. I would hope not. Would I mean, this, um, I mean, does this type of siding have that kind of a life? There's we certainly hope. hope it. I mean, it's it's the joint that's bringing between the two of them. Um, the product doesn't sort of degrade. Um, we don't build any, you know, full masonry buildings anymore. <laughs> you know, it's not something you can, anybody can afford, pretty much. Um, but we're building. You're, you're seeing a lot of these buildings go up, and they're they really perfected the systems. I think the metal buildings that you see along the roads are essentially, you know, one of these kind of systems, which is a to just. You know, this is what you would do for um, if you were doing conventionally framing, and you would build. This is a rain screen, which means that the water can get through it. You know, and it fall, and it would fall potentially just in joints, not behind the product. So the actual weather type wall is behind it. That's called a rain screen. And you know, we've we've done quite a few of these, and so we'd be using this product that got wood walls instead of of wood, maybe because people haven't been so reactive to the wood, but we're still under consideration for that. But those buildings you see alongside the roads had these kind of walls, but they were they had bag insulation behind, them, literally bags that were stuffed in behind, and and you know. That's, you can't you can't meet the energy code anymore. So the the metal people have come up and they've really stepped it up. There's a lot of different profiles, um, all different kinds of profiles, but they have stepped it up and they have come up with these kind of systems that um, that are really efficient that act as the the air and vapor membrane, the whole thing as one. So you buy these larger pieces and go together, and and they have enough textures and. Um, and we're, what we're looking to do is, is do the vertical, the vertical, um, a vertical member on the big buildings, and then on the administration pieces, using a flatter, you know, a little bit more rectangular pattern, so there'll be a change. And then with those orange members, which were wood at one time or whatever, we're looking to use something with more shadow, more texture, and some more, a little bit more color, and those will light it up. But then there's some metal channels around the building that will. Um, 
also been covered. So, I, you know, we think the building is going to look actually very utilitarian, but quite handsome. <laughs> you know, I think it's good design. So. What's the three-inch material? Um, that is, um, yeah. is that a polyisocyanate? Yeah, I'm, I'm it's a get spray. It right. it's, like, it's, a, it's a sprayed in insulation, so it expands to that. Dimension. Let me get it right, so I don't give you the wrong name. Because every product is slightly different. It's a uh, polyisocyanate. <laughs> as opposed to mineral fiber or whatever. Uh, so this is the system we're using. Yeah. Um, and there's, there are two gaskets that go into right. those returns in that, so that's, it's, there's a double membrane beyond the metal that's right. at the, the uh, joints. And these aren't structural? This, no. The steel they, frame they, is they supporting the roof. Oh, yeah. And there's, a, and there's a steel frame system and a guard system, course, off the system that will support this you know, soft guard system. So it, it's braced at a distance. These panels are quite large, though. They come, um, depending on the companies, and we have to kind, because we have to bid this through multiple companies, we can't control either the pattern necessarily or the texture, but we can, by selecting the right ones, we can, uh, we're gonna, it'll be about three feet, and some of these panels go 14 feet high and 16 feet high, so they'll be a joint. Um, so, so that's and, and it you know it's a pretty affordable system. You're getting all the insulation value. You're getting a durable product. You're getting a finished inside material. Now the the administration spaces will have drywall on the inside. They'll be they'll you will not see the inside of the panel in those spaces. But it'll have the same the same insulation value. We don't do insulation in studs anymore. It's just not the way it's done anymore. It's, it's gone by the wayside many years ago. Uh, maybe wood houses might have them, but no big construction. All insulation is on the outside of the building now, on the outside of the structure. So that's the way it's done. It's been done that way for more than 10 years. Um, standard of the industry back. Yeah. Yes. It looks to me like not much light can come through this block. So how effective is this? As it's a pretty good. I wish I had some pictures of it, but it's very effective. Right. I mean, we're talking about... Um, pieces of glazing that are continuous over mm -hmm. a hundred and some feet that are about four to five feet tall. I think. Is that yes. Four to five mm -hmm. feet tall. So we're talking about glazing this big. So sure. when you get in a much bigger panels, you'd see light. Um, I, I, yeah. I could see your fingers through it. Your, I could see your thumbs. I think that's when it is not a clear my one. There's, through the whole line. There, there are, there's a frosted, which I think that's the, the other that side is frosted. And then the side that's closest to Jim is the more yeah. clear tone. Yeah. You can actually get a green tone and a blue tone. It's, that's more for looks from the inside. I think what we want to go for is more light. More light. Sure. So it's a relatively inexpensive, I mean, you know, if we could put lots of glazing up there, you know, to kind of seriously think, but you can't afford that. Either. So, we, you know, we try, we look for a realistic product that's successful. Uh, the one product you probably hear more about is cow wall. Um, that you see that a lot, you know. Um, we are not specifying a product like cow wall. Uh, so, you know, they have, it's not, it's not, has, it's not as energy efficient, um, and it's, you know, it's a product for a different, it's a different time. And you know, so there's a lot more products out like this nowadays are much more energy efficient, and that's what we'll be doing. Um, so I think... Um, yeah, this actually comes with an insulating value. So. Yep, mm -hmm. an insulating value. So how are people feeling about the architecture? Are you feeling the, <laughs> the plans? I think um, it looks great. Yeah, okay. yeah it's very attractive. All right, well, we'll be working on it. We'll Mr. Chairman, is that... Uh, yeah, no, I, I like it better than what we saw the other day. Yeah, I, yeah it's a little bit more time. Yeah. yeah. I think the, um, the, the 3D images help you get a sense of the scale and where the shadows will be and where the overhangs mm -hmm. are, things we talked about. Um, and, um, you know, just working to put it all together now. Hopefully the estimate will come in, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> and we'll be able to do it. But um, I think that, you know, I don't think you'll have any problem being very comfortable with saying this is a utilitarian building, but it looks handsome, it's, you know, and it, it's got a good, um, good, strong um, design sense, and it's very clear when you'll enter the building, and, and it'll, you know, protect the, the, you know, there are is a lot of dirt that comes off of these trucks and everything, and the lower portion of the building will be well protected. So, okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming out. Okay. Thank you, George. <laughs> <laughs> really I've seen stuff. I won't stop I got it. 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 I
It gets bigger and better all the time. A lot of details. Get that chance to cool off. Yeah, but it's on standby. I don't know. It's just a lot of Yes, I know. Yes, I we, we have it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, Beck Abbott with the one year extension of water meters and electronic transmitters. Yeah, right. To EJ Prescott. This is our, um, I believe, our second and final extension of this contract. It's about $100,000 a year. This is the first one. This is the second extension. Yes. <laughs> 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 so it's about a hundred thousand dollars a year. It is uh, capped with a. Uh, I shouldn't say capped, but there's a caveat in there. If there's an increase from the manufacturer, it has to be below the CPI. So there's a little fluctuation in the contract year to year, but it's definitely under a CPI. Yeah. So, um, like I said, last year we spent a. Uh, $91,931.30. So it's about $100,000 a year we're spending on it. And this allows us to... Drive-by houses and read meters without drive, stopping. Drive-by drive readers. Yep. And we had the conversation last board meeting about trying to do the entire city and the cost of trying to do that so we could go to monthly billings if we deem necessary. But, but if these things we're putting in would on a one of house at a time support that. It is, and that's yeah. what we're doing. We're just a couple a week here and there, and we're slowly getting it done. Any questions, comments? All in favor of approving the contract? Aye. 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 Uh, change order number two to contract 301-11 for the old Wilson Road water main construction to Jack Concalves and Sons in the amount of $2,800. No. This is just... This on Hatfield Street, in back of Steve Susco's property, where we had a uh, storm system washout down there that blew apart the bank, exposed the gas main. We went back in there, um, rip wrapped it, redirected the flow with a piece of pipe. The rip wrap was not large enough for our specifications to hold up to the water that came through, so it started eroding again. So this is additional work done by the contractor to go in there and place larger rip wrap down by the outfall. Work's completed and uh, it, uh, by understanding, it held up to last night's rain event. So it's it caged in? Rain. No. No. Okay. Questions? Um, okay, all in favor of approving the change order? Aye. Aye. Uh, contract for LP gas for the water treatment plant. Both approval. Second. Uh, this was a bid that was put out. We only had one bidder this year, George Propane. Um, last year was a dollar sixty four point nine cents a gallon. This year it's two dollars and one and a half cents per gallon. So there was a thirty five percent thirty five cent increase from last year on this contract. And this will supply our, our fuel needs for the year up there. And we we asked other people a bit. We did. I'm sure we did. Okay. It's a formal bid. Yeah. It's out there to everyone. It's advertised in the paper. It doesn't, and I don't know. Actually, Dave Sparks did send it out to some, too, and called other people because we only had one bid, and they said the market was too volatile. They didn't want to bid on it. So is the product. This is true. <laughs> <laughs> only, right. when, only when released. <laughs> uh, all right, all in favor of approving that contract. Okay. Aye. Aye. Uh, next, a discussion of tourism signs. Oh, very small decision to be made. It was very unclear from the emails that came back from the board as to what they really liked and didn't like. I got the understanding that you were looking at number three, the lowest tier one, with the 
white border outline. There was some confusion about whether or not you wanted the blue border, white border, then blue inside. Um, so we're just trying to get that final decision so that we can order signs for Goddard's Winery. I like number three. I thought everyone would like three. Yeah. There was one like person, three. I can't think who it was, who had some kind of words for the circle with the arrow. But right. Only one person mentioned right. that. But I think there was a question about the border trim, which one it was also. So Lord just wanted to confirm that through the board uh, before we ordered the signs, because once you set the process, all the tourism signs are going to be the same. Um, I like I like three. I like, I like three, three too. I think that what makes it work for me is the fact that the the mileage and the arrow are in the same box, and it, 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 you don't have to say miles. That it just tells you it's miles. If you look at it without it, it's not. What is that three? Is that the address? Or, three I don't know. Yeah, looks like having yeah, the, the, the mileage three within letters. a box with the arrow. And, and I like three. I'm, I'm assuming that the white border is the same. Um, Size as the vertical break? Yes. Yeah. I like it, actually, it appears that the vertical break might be a little bit wider than the border. No, oh, that's it. It's, it's, it's out then. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think we're all saying three. Three. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, Jim. Can I just make a comment on signs in general? I, I've been out in my neighborhood placing signs, and our street sign inventory is bad down in the Bridge Street area. Okay. Uh, you missing or fading? Missing. Okay. If you're going to look for Hubbard Avenue or uh, there's a three or four of them down there, you can't find street signs. And if you really don't know the streets, you're in trouble. Okay. So how does that normally get resolved? Oh, we, we put them up. But to, to, like I, we lost a street sign last winter, and I, I wrote to Ned. Um, do, do people in the neighborhoods have to ask? Yeah. Uh, did they put it up? They did. Oh, gee. I'm Typically, surprised. it's reported to us as being stolen, lost, damaged, faded. It's generally, for the chair of the board, they don't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> we put it in our work order system, and it gets completed in a somewhat timely manner. We realize street signs are public safety. Okay. Um, so we have the decision on the tourism signs. Now we need a SWAC update. It's on the board behind you. Mm. Um, we had an extraordinary. Do we have a beating since we had the reuse fair? No. The reuse fair was on the 17th, and the last meeting was on the 14th. So, we didn't know that we did this extraordinarily over the top successful reuse uh, and had probably about 500 cars we estimated. We had about 250. So 240 surveys that came in, and I'm lowballing what the estimate is for the cars because I, it was really, it was just solid on all morning. Uh, took away four boxes to the roof of uh, rigid plastics, and um, we uh, we have a little contest to see who who's guessing the right tonnage in the in the committee. Uh, out of the surveys that came back, um, we we are analyzing that. Uh, we, we sort of very briefly debriefed because we spent a little time going next door to the uh, mass DPW site so to look at that to see what might be a possibility. Uh, and then started really organizing ourselves to work on some next events that are coming up. Shredding. Uh, October 23rd, we're doing something else, but it didn't make it it's up there. I can't remember exactly what it was. And then in December, we're doing a toy exchange. The idea is trying to do something about once a month to sort of keep momentum going. Uh, what I will say is it drew in a whole bunch of new volunteers to work with us. So that's where we are. And did uh, using the Smith parking lot seem like a good idea? It did, uh, although we've talked a little bit about really, I mean, we didn't expect the volume that we had. I yeah. mean, it really, 
flew our socks off. Uh, so we'd have to use more of the site uh, and use the back side. But it, the fact that it was happening in the front really drew a lot of attention. Uh, and we were lucky to have the volunteers that we needed there uh, because that, otherwise it would have been an absolute madhouse. And we had some new people, like I said, come, come out of the woodwork to help us. So. But everyone felt very, very positive about it. We really got some very nice press and uh, just felt like it was a very good event. So, did we end up with anything left over that the DPW had to clean up? People bring things that didn't belong there? Uh, we had a small pile. Uh, what we did realize is sort of the rate limiting factor was that the, the best eyes in terms of a uh, person who knew what could go in the stuffsters and what couldn't was Karen, and she was really out straight. <laughs> she was organizing the vet, trying to tell the volunteers what to do, and then also saying, no, not that. We actually had an area where we laid some of the things out that looked useful, and we had a number of the volunteers who were taking things that looked like they could be reusable over and setting them out on the lawn. But we probably spent about a half hour, 45 minutes after after we closed up, sort of taking up, the yeah. things that we'd put out that we thought had some, some function that people might like, and then putting them into the, uh, the uh, dumpsters. But there was a lot of people who came, and we invited them to take anything they wanted, there were a number of people who, towards the end of the event, they'd pull in the parking lot and I'd say, are you here to shop or drop off? Mm -hmm. And if they were shopping, I'd send them over to park and they'd go over and people were taking stuff away, which we were very yes. pleased to see. So, yeah. Yeah. Well. And I got to say, uh, kudos to uh, the public relations, you know, the media piece that uh, Karen got out there and also the, all the volunteers and the hard work that they did. That's great. Jesus? Yeah, I just wanted to add that, um, there that we compiled all the information from the surveys and I sent that out to Karen Bullen. So if you want to like look at, you know, all of the information from the different surveys and what people said and how people found out about the event, that's you know, information that's available. Right, we'll probably filter back through Yeah, I, I haven't seen that yet, but I'm sure we'll hear it through the next committee. Can I just confirm is that the October fifteenth is shredding, paper shredding? 15th is the shred, yes, shredding, not shedding. Yeah, I just want to confirm. <laughs> yes, and I think that's a JFK. Wait, is that the electronics event? Is that is that October 23rd the electronics event? I thought that was the 15th, but maybe No, I'm the wrong. 15th is definitely the shredding because yeah. oh, I wrote okay. that that information so couple that came off of Karen's. <laughs> and what's the what's the um like quantities or I'm mean, like what's the situation of that like for the shredding? Is it going to be like a big truck thing that shreds it or how does that work? Uh, I think they're bringing in that big that big professional truck that you throw things into but I do know that we're trying to really get some information out there and it, it'll be on our website and, and in the we need to be better about communicating things out to the public loudly so right. that they know it's coming. You know I just but the company I, I work for has a lot of stuff that has to be shredded and we were talking about finding in compilation with one of these things happening, so. I'm hoping I can say with confidence, go to the website, please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's the game plan. Thank you for our savings. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I just wanted to, somewhere I read something about fiber. This fiber recycling thing, and it sounded like all kinds of clothing and possibly carpeting. I carpeting was wasn't accepted, but uh, Salvation Army was there taking things that you wouldn't that um, not donated clothes, not clothes that had reuse function, but everything else, all that other stuff, all that other textile materials. Let me rephrase carpeting. I think I understood maybe uh, throw rugs. Throw there's rugs, no, there's yes. No, uh, there's no rubberized backing, backing yeah. whatever. Yeah. 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 yeah, okay. So even like a, a possibly a large one. Yes. Okay. As uh, long as it doesn't have that rubber on it. I can't remember the kind of rug that they're called. They're, it's like a braided rug. It's an old shape. It's a braided rug. A braided, braided rug. rug. I would call it a braided so rug. So braided rugs would fall into that category? Yes. So if you if you miss that event, is it is there another one coming up or is this can this oh, go right to sell yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> Just the one. <laughs> Just the one. Um, <laughs> it's in the garage. Hold up. You know, the Salvation Army was a great little self-contained piece, and we talked about having it uh, at, we, we actually talked about having um, them there more frequently. So, but I could contact them yes. if I didn't want to wait for, you know, another month. Yes. But, uh, but we also didn't want to make it too crazy or too complicated yeah. too early. Yeah. Okay, and then one last question from Jesus or comment? Well, yeah, actually, I had thought that Karen Bullen had said that it was going to be an ongoing program here at the city where we would actually be 
um, accepting the, you know, like the rags and like, I don't know, refuse textiles on an ongoing basis for Salvation Army. I don't recall hearing that. That might be true, but I think that we've got to, there's, it feels like things are always in flux, and right. I, I would like us to have one place where we can all go and with some definition know what we can get rid of where, and I think that really should, needs to be our website. Thanks. I think that concludes the agenda. Oh, you know, I was going off of uh, this morning's thing. No, we did not. Thank you. I'm well, just going through here looking. Actually, I've got number six. It's sure some signs. I've got. Have you got number you have an six? Old one. Old agenda. Seven. Seven. You know, you took it off. Actually, could I just interrupt? Okay. I actually did specifically come to the meeting to ask a question. All right, well, hang on. I'll, I'll get okay. to it. Um, all right, so this, uh, the wetland uh, yeah, delineation taken off. is taken off. Yeah. All right. So this is normal. Yeah. Oh, but thank you. I, okay. So, um, Gary, is there anything that you would hope we would talk about that we didn't? Nothing you want to bring up. Update on that. Yeah, A number of different things in your board package. Uh, some are for reference only. Letter from one of our rate, uh, water rate users that you should have read. Uh, one promotion internal to our engineering department, Dave Valletta. I believe you all have met if you pointed to our senior engineer. Tom Smith is uh, last day, is on Friday. Uh, he's been with us for over 35 years in engineering. So he's uh, elected to retire. His last day will be Friday. Uh, does, for those who, if I could just ask quickly, does that mean that the landfill now is, needs a new manager? Uh, we'll be advertising for a new environmental engineer. Dave will be doing uh, wearing many hats over the next month or two while we find that replacement. So it will, it will function without, uh, without flaw. I'm sure. And we have two principal account clerks that we're hiring. Uh, one was from the passing of uh, one of our clerks, Sue, uh, recently. The other one was one that we had in limbo. We were trying to see if we could do without the clerk. And we found out we're just getting more and more behind that we really need the position filled. We we're trying to save some money and uh, we just need to fill it. So we have those three things in here. Uh, for those who are curious, uh, there is a retirement party tomorrow afternoon from 3 to 7 at the Florence Civic Center uh, for Tom. So those who might be interested to fare him well, he'll be there. Two other things, there is a public uh, transportation plan and draft that was in your package also. Mm -hmm. uh, this was uh, sent out from the Transportation Parking Commission looking for comments from the Board of Public Works. So now if you have this document, if you could review and have any comments you have ready for your next board meeting in October. And the last thing was information only, uh, a functional design report uh, from Niche Engineering for the intersection of Conn Street and Pleasant Street. Uh, informational only, uh, right now they are seriously looking at placing a roundabout out there. What, uh, You'll be able to make a copy of each of those for me. Sure. Please. Does the... Did I get any? No. Does the... Sent it on email, but I didn't make a photocopy of it. We'll give you copies of it, Jim. Yeah, please. And any other board members that want us to print that out for you? I gave one to Dave. Okay. Did I get that? Oh, no, you didn't. Sorry. Um, so, getting back to the Con Street intersection, yes. um, is this just moving along through some state process and where we just live in their world watching what happens? Or? Um, we were involved in the road safety audit. Uh, we've been involved into uh, public meetings to date on it. That have been held at Mass DOT on this. We probably met with niche engineering perhaps four times since they've been hired, about six months ago. Uh, Mass Highway, or Mass DOT, excuse me, is paying for the engineering, uh, get it into the TIP program for funding, so hopefully this will be a viable project in 
four to five years might be constructed. Uh, what's pressing Mass Highway with this is that they really want the city to take over the layout all the way to the bowling alley or our, our flood control dike is. And uh, uh, Mayor Higgins at that point said if you fix this intersection, which is a high volume crash intersection for the city, I think is one of the top 10 or top 100 in the region, um, that we would consider taking over the state layout and making it a local road. Oh, so they'd fix it and then turn the whole thing over to us? From basically about 130 feet <coughs> southerly of the Hoyle Street intersection out is state highway layout in the city. So basically we would take what we know as Pleasant Street and become a city way instead of a state layout. And what advantage would that give us? Um, more plowing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, why would we even consider it? That was something that the mayor committed to. Uh, I, I'm on the Transportation and Parking Commission, and I was at the presentation, and I thought it was great. I think another roundabout, one advantage would be the, the gateway thing. I don't know if you mentioned that yep. exactly, but... Uh, I think it really would. Uh, I think it would slow traffic. I think it would have a significant traffic calming effect. Well, I, I'm not. Uh, I think it would solve some problems. I'm not. I know sure. we wouldn't have to. Well, yeah. she said if we took over, if they fixed the intersection, we would consider taking over. Mm -hmm. or is that, is that I don't think it's a done deal. I right. think so the new council has to accept it. Thanks as for the way. way. Just yeah. thought the plow road. Yeah, I, I, I'm not. Criticizing the project itself. Yeah, yeah. It's why in the world would we want to take it over? We got enough money. We don't get enough money now. We don't. We all know that. We already have all our utilities in there. The only thing that's not owned by the city is the storm system. That would be transferred as part of that process also. Yeah, apparently they're trying to sweeten the pot as much as they can. Yeah, a million dollar project they run about? A million plus. Yeah. Well, that's their project anyways. Oh, but they, they might not have moved forward on that? Um, they would, one of the reasons they're doing it is they own it, so they need to pay for the engineering services. I have no idea what that contract is, how they came up with niche engineering to do the work, versus like us when we did the roundabout. We had to pay for all the design services up front, get it into the tip, and then wait for state and federal funding because it was our idea? Or Just the way the program works, the proponent who wants the project has to pay for the engineering design okay. up front. So Mass Highway owns this project because they own the layout out there, so they're paying for those fees up front. Okay. Okay. Anything else, man? That's it, thank you. Jimmy? Terry? I'm concerned about the Red Sox, and I'm wondering how they're doing tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. You mean it might be time to go. Well, we'll, we'll move right along. MJ? Um, two things. Um, I was at the parents' meeting, uh, parents' night at the high school last week, and there's some movement afoot to uh, have us continue to take a look at the crosswalk safety in front of the high school. So, I think they're coming your way. My way? Yeah. Oh, no. yeah. They want Smith to do something about it. No, no, no. It's I mean, only fair. Aren't you on the, on the transportation I side? I am. Yeah. I'm not sorry. No, they have been. They, they, they were, uh, they were supposed, they were on the agenda for the last meeting. They couldn't make couldn't, it. They couldn't make it. Yeah. Uh, and the second thing is, is that, where are we in moving forward on the recommendations that came out of the solid waste group last spring? I mean, I know that my little committee is uh, dealing with the use, but where are we in terms of starting to prepare for our next iteration of solid waste management? You, you're on the solid waste task for you. You're looking at us. Uh, let's see. Well, uh, all right. I, I kind of agree. I mean, clearly, because we've got, we've we got could defuse some of the questions about the, um, or perhaps not, def we could clarify some of the issues around the handicap discount if we had these policies done. Um, what else is there that you're thinking of? Well, just preparing for the closing for next year and what that might look like, whether or not we, I mean, we're going to need to make some decisions about... I brought the list. 
Well, I think that one of the things that we agreed upon was that the even though the landfill would close, we would maintain both transfer stations. That's the and that the price structure would change, and that's where the catalyst for coming up with a discounted service was really going to come into effect because of the cost going up. So, I mean, I guess that's why you'd have to talk about cost structure, but I believe that's what, I mean, Jim was there. He can tell me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Clearly, the task force gave us a, a goal of keeping the two transfer stations open, and I, I don't think anyone's disputing that or uh, questioning that. Um, is it premature to be talking about a budget? Well, I think it's something that we haven't had time to work on. I think that's, that's pretty clear. Um, Karen's been straight out with a lot of the things that uh, the energy has talked about, and I know David also has been pretty straight out, and we haven't really had a chance to, to work on it yet. We've got a little bit of time, but I think um, it's going to be up to staff to, to go through the recommendations and put some of our thoughts together and present them to the board. We haven't, we haven't had a chance to do that. But it's essentially a status quo situation. We've, we've got the staff, we've got the physical plant, we've got the, especially for the part, the part of it that's right here, it's just business as usual in a way. But don't, I, I, and I guess I'm asking this because I, I think in the past we've said we've got about a year where we've got some funds that we can use from the solid waste enterprise fund to support this. But at some point, that fund is not going. When well, we're not getting revenues anymore from the landfill, right. we're not going to have those revenues streaming in. And so, what you know, in terms of planning, how we're going to do some of the other stuff that we're relying on that revenue to help us with right now, shouldn't we be thinking about what it's going to look like next year, and what services we actually can provide? You know? Well, I was hoping that. Um one of the reasons I was pushing for the bank program was to l let that piece of it settle out. And see how, you know, and as Karen said, it's too soon to really gauge, read too much into the numbers. Um, the point that I've made is that we have an opportunity, while we have a little extra money from the landfill, to uh, try any ideas that make sense, even if there's a budget number attached to them. For example, what you did here, right. I don't think it had too big a number attached to it, but if, if anyone can think of an idea that we should try, this would be a great time to try it in order to get ready for what, whatever, whatever it is. Whatever, what's next. Yeah. I think the rollover of the fees of the, the food waste composting program is a pretty good example of that. You know, we feel like we've got a year to get uh, good data. We had a lot of folks signed up for it and now that we're charging a fee, we've seen a lot fewer people with the cards, but we want to see how sustainable that is if the fees are set in order to prepare ourselves for the time when there's less money to do programs like that. So it's, it's one small example, but there, you know, there may be other storage and plastics and some other things that we're doing. We'll, we'll get cost data from those programs. So there's a lot of, I think there's a fair amount of data gathering that will be going on. And if you, if your group or, or even you may say, listen, you know, we need another staff person to work on this or whatever it turns out to be, but events like this happening every four to six weeks, I mean, I think that's what people are asking for us. Oh, yeah, and I think we are working on that. I think the, the question I just keep hearing out there is what's going to happen when the landfill closes. And, you know, I know that our recommendations were to um, everyone loves a transfer station and to keep those going, but there had been some discussion about whether or not it was more cost-effective to do town-wide municipal recycling, the curbside pickup. There was some discussion, but and I guess I didn't have the sense that we firmly made the decision that we're going to continue everything as is. That was the recommendation that came to the board, but has the board made that decision? No, I see. That question? Well, I mean, this well, is... Well, wait, actually, no, I, okay. I worked out trying to keep the discussion here on the table. Although that is why I'm here. I appreciate that. That particular question. And you know, we don't need to answer that tonight. I'm just trying to put it on our agenda so that we, if that's the recommendations and we're accepting them, then we've accepted the recommendations and we're moving forward with those recommendations. Does, doesn't it seem early to be um, making 
Well, I guess it's not early to be t too early to be talking about this. Well, it only and my thoughts are is that it's going to play into the budget discussion for the next fiscal year, which starts early. July first. Well, the this budget prep starts in what? January. Yeah. Well, it would help at least me to see the recommendations that the committee came up with, so we could. <clears throat> maybe I could take this left right here. All right, so how about, <laughs> so sounds like maybe we should put this on the, those pesky Red Sox are well, probably no, no, giving away the Red Sox. No score. Oh, no score? No score. How would you know that? <laughs> I have a sense. He has a... <laughs> uh, so, all right, so we need to refine this a little bit and put it on the agenda. Yeah, this is the only thing. I'm not asking for us to make a decision tonight. It's just it was recommendations that we accepted. And there was one little split off that the solid waste committee is doing. <laughs> that has to do with the reuse, but there's other a whole series of other recommendations. So right. the, the pay as you throw has happened, been implemented. We've had the discussions about the means based piece, but there's several other recommendations there. And how are we going to move forward either on accepting and moving forward and implementing those recommendations? Or coming up with another decision. Do you have a copy of that for me? Yeah, and, and also, <laughs> also how, is that, that how is that all that going to work in with the new? Mm -hmm. we or, or could you email us down below right. if we purchase that? You can do that. So, right. You know, there's, there's uh, a talk about the, an expanded facility down there that would do much more than what you can do here. Mm -hmm. You know, and. Uh, so that's got to play into it also. Gary. I just have one question about the, I know with the transfer station here, we have a, a we're, we're now, um, we have our own uh, truck to move the trash, I think. Mm -hmm. is, or is it just the recyclables? Is it no, it does both. How many, how many trucks uh, Saturday, which has got to be the day for the week, do we have to move out? Or is it? One box. Outside. Well, we have a staging area outside that's part of the transfer station, so typically he probably moves probably one recycling box and definitely a trash box during a Saturday event here. So Weekday like, events, it's not as often. So, during like, so we really need to look at a week. Is he doing two or three boxes a week of each? Or? He, that truck's driven literally 40 hours a week between going down to the Murph and Springfield with recyclables to <coughs> running with metal hauling up to Greenfield to running to the landfill with waste. Okay. So what's the big change when the landfill closes is where is the waste going to go? That's I'm correct. presuming it's going to go wherever the market takes their trash now, mm -hmm. outside of our landfill. I go to Valley Recycling. Really? Can awesome. I? If it's a cheap rate, why not? I mean, so we were just transporting box two miles to another sure. spot where they're going to take that box some other place. Yep. They but take it by transfer trailer. Easy. We don't. That sound easy to you? <coughs> sounds it, like our bag rate might go up. That's about the worst yeah. that's going to happen. It will be market driven. Yeah. Hey, Susan. Yeah. Um, I had actually come to the meeting because I think that there have been, you know, there's obviously been a very long discussion about the landfill closing and solid waste initiatives and even environmental responsibility. And I think one thing that has been really difficult in all these discussions is that there's no real established role of the city in solid waste management. Like, I, I think it's something that you had brought up at a meeting before. Like, the Board of Public Works, it's not in your charter to do anything about solid waste. I mean, the role of the city really, I think, either the Board of Public Works or the City Council should take, you know, some portion of a meeting to, you know, look at that idea and, like, establish what is the role of the city in solid waste management, or is it to be, to provide, you know, an environmentally responsible way for people to deal with their trash? Is it for, you know, to that the city, you know, is providing cost-effective solutions for people to dispose of trash? Is it, you know, just fend for yourself like East Hampton? I mean, like, what... I mean, that that seems to be pretty central to the discussion of what, you know, what we want to do in, in, in terms of solid waste initiatives. 
we're, we're a little trapped. Uh, the task force got to yes on does the city have a role to play uh, almost instantaneously. But at the same time, the charter were, our, ten, our charter was that the city was not willing to incur any cost. So whatever we did with this role had to be self-sustaining. Um, which puts us, and there was some resistance to curbside pickup, which seems to be uh, advantageous in many, um, from many points of view. So we're left with this kind of uh, somewhat murky situation where we've got the competition down to 10. Uh, we don't exactly know what the cost structure of all this is going to look like, and we're clearly trying to piece our way into this, stay as true to what the task force asked for as we can. Um, it's not uh, crisp. Perhaps Mimi will have a... Uh, well, I, I kind of hear what uh, Jesus is saying, which is the fact that is it, I mean, the Board of Public Works took over the running of the landfill prior to, prior to it, it was the Board of Health. Mm -hmm. And then it was determined that this was the better entity for it. But the real question is, is it really the purview of the Board of Public Works to be determining what the solid waste future of the city looks like, or would it be a city council thing? And I think that uh, one of the things that, uh, I'm not sure if it was one of our recommendations, but I think that the city council itself should be creating their own task force and looking at this also. Um, you know, I, I think it's a, a, it's a image of what do we want for the future of, of the city. Uh, but with that being said, the majority, and it was a one person, you know, it was, it was like a five to four vote, I believe, basically uh, wanted to stay with the current situation of the transfer station. I'm not sure if it was that Glendale Road would also be as a drop-off spot. That was kind of a back and forth, whether it would just maintain as a place to bring your um, lawn things. But that because it would be such a huge transition for the community when the landfill closes, to try to lessen that, to not go right into curbside because it would be a big transition. So it's a, it was, it's a double-edged sword. But I think that's why a lot of people were leaning towards you know, and a lot of the feedback from the people in the community was they want the transfer station to stay open. So um, that that's all. But it, it really is a good question as to which group of the city should be making those decisions. If it really is, I mean, you guys got it by default, really. So. Well, that's that's unfortunately it's it's our decision right now, and uh, and we have to deal with it. Uh, I think our biggest expense uh, when the landfill closes is going to be to purchase another truck and to deal with uh, all of the hauling that we need to deal with. And uh, uh, as far as curbside pickup, the city is not willing. I don't think the taxpayer is willing to foot the bill for a curbside pickup. Uh, it's an expensive proposition. Uh, if you check with any city that's doing it, uh, it's a very expensive proposition. And uh, I don't see the city of Northampton going that way. But that's my, my opinion. All right, so, so maybe you could, uh, we'll wrap this up. Um, so maybe you could give some thought, and then I will, and we all should, I guess, to, we need to pick one or two things here that, should get to work on next. Well, and you know, make you know, I think explicitly make some decisions about if we decide that yes, you know, we're going to follow the recommendations and keep the transfer stations open. Uh, tell people that. I mean, there's this this body of information that's flowing around that's called recommendations that we've accepted, but we haven't explicitly said yes, that's our plan. Could I get a copy of those too? I'll email them. Yeah. yeah All right, that's a good discussion. You yeah. better be able to choose. So let's put it on the next agenda and let me think about it. I mean, we need to break it up into little pieces, but let's, it's a good discussion. Maybe too, it's too much for the end of a meeting. But yeah. I, I, just, I, like, I just brought it up because I, yeah. I, I had this sense out here that, no, that right. there were recommendations that had been made, but we as a body had not made a decision to implement those. Sure. Done much. And that, that was my question. And it doesn't have to be the next meeting. It's just, please, can we start this conversation before we're working hard on next year's fiscal year budget because it might have implications. Right. And I take that back. It's not that we haven't done much. I, 
uh, it's really great the bank program is done. Mm -hmm. What you people did last uh, Saturday, I think, was terrific. Yeah. Um, so it's not that we haven't done much, but we haven't been systematic about working on this. I make a motion we adjourn. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, was, I was talking at the same time. Yeah. But you're all set? Yes. Okay, great. Motion to adjourn. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Call all in favor.